Thank you. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth, for that introduction. Whoa, what's happening here? Okay. There we go. So, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about how the past can influence current practice. And I'm going to start with a quote by this guy here. So I spent a lot of time in archives for my PhD research. And when I read the call for papers for ATI Pi this year, I immediately thought of this quote. And what's happening here basically is this guy, Wolfgang, he's, in, he's, he's just expressing a lot of despair over the fact that there aren't any new typefaces in 1553. In 1553, the invention of print is still fairly new, right? So by his logic, and if you fast forward to 2017, all of you people who identify as type designers in this room are pretty screwed. But I don't entirely agree, and people do continue to do new things, and as type designers, we all are fascinated by doing something that is charming, that is new, and coming up with creative ideas that others haven't done before. And my area of expertise is the Arabic script, so I'm going to talk a bit about how some people have done that, and hopefully that will be solutions that you and the audience can also apply to your work. And this doesn't only apply to the Arabic script, hopefully this concept can be applied to other scripts as well. So, when you start to look into this idea of doing something new, and if you take a step back from strict typeface design and other fonts that are out there, you start to look at things like this. Now, this is what in Iran we refer to as naqoshikhat, which translates to calligraphic painting. And it's a really good example of how the design, the artist here, who is Muhammad Ehsai, he is a master Nasadi calligrapher from Iran. He's very familiar with letter proportions. He's a calligrapher. He understands white space very well, and he knows how much he can push letters and bend them without breaking them. And the more I looked for examples like this, I started to find that the common thread through all of these innovative ideas of how to draw letters is Calligraphy, and the importance of calligraphy in the Arabic script is undeniable, and it's probably unparalleled in any other script, and if I'm wrong, tell me. But here's a chart, I really like this chart. It shows you different styles, and the top row you can see the names of the different styles, and then all the different letters in these styles. Already here, you're getting a lot of visual information on how to diversify your design. So, for instance, if you look here, in the row that's been highlighted, Nas Sadiq. Nas Sadiq was a style that was developed in Iran. As you can see, the letter forms are very round, they're very soft. And to this day, if you look at typefaces that are preferred in Iran, they're all a bit more soft, a bit more round, and this is purely because of the aesthetic conditioning that we're all used to in Iran. Whereas if you look at the row next to it, which is Ruka, a style that was developed in Ottoman Turkey, beautiful in its own right, but the letters are much shorter, they're more clipped, they're more blunt, and more angular. And what happens is this style, which is widely preferred in countries like Egypt and, well, formerly Turkey, you will never see this, it, you will very rarely see this in the typographic past of Iran. It's just not really like there. So already you're getting some information design-wise on how to do something for your clients that is conditioned to their aesthetic preferences. But calligraphy also does more than that. So if you look at the row that's highlighted here, it's the letter meme. Now, one other thing that we can do when we look at calligraphy is to see different features, because as you can see, there are many different ways in which this letter can be written. 
Yet, in most typefaces that you look at today, the tail of this letter is a straight swash downwards. The examples on the bottom row are an illustration of what I'm talking about. As you can see, the tail is just going straight forward down. So when I was designing Athelas Arabic, which is the big one there that you can see, I was trying to do something that's more soft to match the other letters and the Latin and the other scripts that already existed for Athelas Arabic without making it look too childish. And I decided to borrow the feature of a swash tail. And you will be amazed at how many people just came up to me and said, that's wrong. It's not wrong. Um, I'm very fortunate to have worked with Jose and Veronica on this, who are very, you know, as designers themselves, they trust you and respect your decisions as a designer. And I think that it's important. What fonts do is they diversify the presentation of information. And as DJR pointed out earlier, maybe people can go with something that's more familiar and comfortable, and I'm okay with that, but it's always sometimes, I think, a good idea to try and inject these little variations where you can, and calligraphy gives you clues on how to do that. And another thing that calligraphy does is that it shows, it, there are very, very strict rules in Arabic calligraphy. And these rules set down a very strong foundation when you start to design. So I get really frustrated when I hear expressions like, there are no rules, there are no foundations for an Arabic, for how to do an Arabic typeface. But there is, you just have to dig a little deeper into the wisdom well. Example of which, it's so, it gets so down to the T. So a lot of you know that the Arabic script is written with a read pen, illustrated here in the dots. What a lot of you might not know is that the angle, the cut for the nib, it changes depending on the style that you want to write. And this is a very exact angle. If you don't have the correct one, a master calligrapher will get very mad at you and you won't be able to do it in the exact right ways. And another thing that exists and this has existed since the 10th century. Ibn Mukla started laying down 12 basic rules of calligraphy. And I know you're looking up there and saying that's a lot more than 12. And it is, because it started in the 10th century. And then other master calligraphers like Yawut Musta Sami, Ibn Bavob, they added more to these. You have very, very clear and strict rules on all of these counts. And I'm sorry if some of it sounds a little strange. This is my own translation from Persian, so. Sorry, um, but they're there, they're very clear, and each of these can be broke down into subcategories as well. So for instance, let's just take one, measurements, and if you look at that more closely, you have something like this. So Ibn Mukla, when he started laying down his base rules, what he came up with was, if you have a circle and there's an aleph in the center, which is the letter that you're seeing up on the screen. If the aleph forms the diameter of this circle, you can then use this circle to draw all the other letters in the alphabet. This was later completed more, and this was just one, measure, one way of doing the measurements. Later, Ibn Bavob added the idea of using the rhombic dot for measurements. The rhombic dot is the dot that your pen will draw if you draw it diagonally on the paper, as you see here illustrated in purple. And what he started to set down was this idea of measuring your writing depending on the pen that you're using and the rhombic dot that your pen makes. So for instance, the muhaqiq alif. Muhaqiq is often referred to as the father of calligraphic styles. The Mahagar Alif is made up of eight dots stacked one on top of the other, which is, and I'm sorry if I'm pointing this out and it doesn't apply to you, the average height of a human being, the proportions are the same. So you're one of your, these guys, your head, you should be able to fit seven of those into the rest of your body. If you measure that and it's not true, I deeply apologize. I think it'll be hard to forget. But yeah. Based on those, you can then take those dots 
and you will have very exact measurements on how to draw every other letter in every different style. So you have your proportions set there exactly as they should be, which is why I'm surprised sometimes to hear expressions like, oh, but we don't have any rules, but we do. The little circles that you see there inside the letter he, which is what you're seeing, those are half dots, yeah. So just another way, and just another slide to illustrate just how much calligraphy can help. In a single letter form, which is the aim that you're seeing here, you can find so many solutions for what to do if you just dig a little deeper into it, like what Toshi was showing us yesterday. He was showing you the Sini style, and there are many other styles that are also unexplored that deserve some more attention. But just some examples of people that have been using these very well. This is a typeface by Jawaharlal Ali. She did it for her Reading project um, a few years back. And she's using calligraphy very well here. So what you're seeing is her basic style, which is a regular NASC-based typeface. And then in red, you can see her secondary style, which she's used as a replacement for italics and Arabic. So what she's done for that is she's used the style that I showed you earlier and I discussed briefly, Ruka, but she's doing something very clever with it. She has eliminated the cascading feature of Ruka and it sits on the same baseline as the Nas. So what this does is, when you're looking at the text, one of them doesn't immediately jump out at you. Now this isn't probably the best example because the other cell's in red and it does indeed jump out at you, but I couldn't find any other pictures, so. It's very clever and it's using purely calligraphy to come up with this solution. Other people have done this and I don't think they blend as well, but in here you can see the two styles marry each other on the page very nicely. Another example is this typeface. This is by Damu Khan Janzadeh. It's called Diba. It's very different. And when you talk to Damu, he'll tell you, he'll be the first one to tell you that it's very calligraphic. In his own right, Damu is a master calligrapher as well. And the inspiration behind this was that for a while, he was an apprentice at a frame maker's shop. And he would cut letters into the wood frames that they would make. There wasn't a lot of room for details, so what would happen instead was that he would have to draw these very sharp, straight lines. When it translated into a typeface, he added a lot of softness in some of the curves, and the proportions that exist are very, very rooted in calligraphy. Another way that design has really changed is technology. So this is a typeface, it's called Mirza, and it's designed by Amir Mo Mahdi Moslehi. When technology started to allow huge character sets, a really interesting thing happened with the Arabic script. A lot of these very calligraphic styles started appearing. They weren't possible before because you would need a huge character set to be able to set text with them seamlessly. But it can happen now. This is automatically said, I haven't retouched anything, I haven't moved anything, and I think it's just beautiful that you can do something like this now. There are other examples of this, Bustani that was done by Patrick Gioson, and uh, Kamal Mansour is a, another good example. There's a lot of nice stuff out there that Decotype is doing. But one thing that has been a huge problem for the Arabic script since the start of printing in it was to be able to justify text nicely. So what you can see here is these extended letters that I've marked. This is done as a measure and a means to justify text in Arabic. You extend some letters and the Arabic is really organic, it really allows for you to do stuff like this because it's so dynamic. You can do this in calligraphy, you can do it to some extent in type, but the results are never quite as fluid and as nice as what you can see in calligraphy. 
But now we have variable fonts, which Peter explained in nice depth the other day. With variable fonts, I started thinking of, okay, maybe it's good that now that this new technology is out there, we start thinking about how we can actually use it to solve some problems that have existed for a long time. And one wonderful thing that you can do for the Arabic script with it, this still needs a lot of work, this is still a prototype, but is this, yes, there we go. To be able to extend and have a lot of in-between extensions for the letters, to be able to set text in nice boxes is a great thing. I think if some lovely people that are more knowledgeable than myself and how you can do the math on this and how to implement this would help, it would actually solve a huge problem that has existed for many, many years for the Arabic script, and I think that would be absolutely amazing, especially if we were, we were able to isolate some of these characters. I think that would be great. One final note before I leave you lovely people. There are a lot of you in this room that are experts in your own field. The Alphabet Mentorship Program could really benefit from your expertise. We have a lot of mentees who want your help. We don't have enough mentors to match them up with. It can be in any field, design, research, teaching, writing, even sometimes just giving people the right networks. Especially you gentlemen, a lot of you have asked me, how can I help to empower women because this keeps coming up and up, up again and again, uh, you will be automatically matched with someone who's recently graduated, a young woman who's recently graduated, or starting out in the field, and you would be helping quite a lot. If you want have any questions about this, Bianca is here, Eleni is here, Liron is here, go up to them and ask them, and I'm sure that they'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you.